Hello, everyone. We This is your two-minute notice. We will get started with the webinar promptly at 11 o'clock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on diversity, equity, and inclusion in philanthropy. We are so happy to have you here. All right, now let's get started. We'd like to give our affiliate partners a brief shout out. They are all across the country and you will see them pop up on your screen. Check to see if there's one in your community. They also provide training and education to fundraisers all in their communities. And this is our mission statement, which really demonstrates our commitment to building up the nonprofit sector by providing professional development to fundraisers. If you are on social media, please give us a shout out by tagging us and using the hashtag SIP webinar. And now I am passing this off to Krista Berry Ortega, our amazing director, to announce and present our incredible speaker. Thank you, Pearl. It is my pleasure to be introducing our amazing presenter and speaker, Armando. Armando and I met in New Orleans earlier this year at the AFP International Fundraising Conference, and we immediately started talking about the buzz that was in the air at the conference on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion in philanthropy and in fundraising. And we knew immediately that we didn't just want to continue to talk about it. We wanted to include all of you in the discussion. So Armando has tons of experience, direct experience in development and nonprofit leadership and is a consultant in diversity and fundraising with a lot of different organizations around the country. So without further ado, I'll let Armando talk a little bit more about himself. And I really am looking forward to this exciting discussion, which is going to be the first of many to come. Welcome, Armando. Fantastic. What a great introduction, Krista and Pearl. Um, I'm so happy uh, to be partnering with the Sanford Institute. And uh, really, uh, great praise to them for taking this role on and, um, you know, really uh, being leaders in this area. A lot of folks uh, need to focus on this. 
And a uh, couple of things, what's unique about this presentation and what's unique about Sanford is that this presentation is very practical. It's, it's not theory and uh, complaining about the subject. There's a lot of articles out there lamenting um, and feeling bad about the lack of diversity in uh, fundraising and philanthropy. Uh, this is not, this is a presentation about what to do about it. Um, and the second thing is, as uh, Krista mentioned briefly, I am a, a consultant working specifically to help nonprofits diversify uh, donors, board, and uh, staff uh, in their, inside their organizations around the country. So um, there's a contact slide at the end of the presentation. You can take a look at that. But let's move along and get into the discussion and get into uh, specifics of where we're, what we're going to talk about first. All right, and so um, we're uh, basically going to focus first on uh, some of the things we're going to learn today. And so uh, first, we're going to talk about specific tactics uh, to retain staff, board, and recruitment as well uh, for all of these uh, aspects of your institutions. Recruitment and retention are super vital uh, for this type of work. Um, also, we're going to design. Uh, and discuss designing donor diversity plans. So um, with all of this type of work, we are doing a general overview. We can't, it's only an hour. Um, plus each of your institutions are different. Um, and so, and, and you're in different geographic, diversity looks different for every place. So each plan will be, it's their very natures. Um, we're also gonna talk about uh, how to identify circles of influence uh, within your community. Uh, donor prospecting, uh, specifically uh, tools to find diverse communities uh, inside your working area. Now, your community may be the country, it may be a state, or may even be just the neighborhood. Um, also, another thing we're going to focus on is how to do donor prospecting at all levels. So, a lot of the uh, training or even discussion what little there is about diversity and fundraising focuses on annual and online mass giving, which is great and that's wonderful, uh, but there's very, very little discussion, if any, on major giving. Um, and so uh, Latino major giving has been my personal specialty, but I've also worked with African-American major giving as well. Um, and so we really want to see diverse populations as a broad brush, not just annual smaller givers. Let's think of them in full spectrum. Um, and so we're also gonna take a look at a handful of case studies of real philanthropy from real people of color, um, specifically a, a high net worth major giving. We should probably advance to the next slide, uh, but we're gonna take a look at some actual case studies, some of which I've studied and I can talk to you more about, um, some of which are more public and the information's out there. Um, and what we're gonna do right now is take a poll. And this poll is gonna be about what sort of uh, strategy or focus your institution has put into um, diverse populations. So the question formally is, does your nonprofit currently have a formal strategy to fundraise from diverse populations? So formal strategy, think of that as a plan, staff, people, funding, focus. Uh, so please take the poll. Uh, it should be on your screen. And then we'll yes, uh, talk about that. For Go ahead. A poll is going to launch on your screen. You're going to have about a minute. Um, you'll see the, the different answers are yes, no, maybe a strategy is in the works. Um, and other, and if you do submit, if you, there, you do select other, please uh, tell us what it, what your answer is in the chat box. So we're going to give it about a minute. Should I play the Jeopardy music right now? <laughs> please do. <laughs> you know, da, 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 that's terrible. We want people to come back to these. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not be horrified. It gives us well, a it's sense of who is on the call today. I am, yeah, I, I am seeing more uh, institutions across the country, large health organizations, 
uh, starting specifically mass marketed Latino campaigns, international organizations um, that fundraise for children's welfare, health, uh, disease prevention. Um, and I know of one environmental organization nationally that's hired somebody to focus on um, diverse populations, which is pretty cool. Definitely. So All right. Let's give it, yeah, let's give it about five more seconds and then we're going to close the poll. So far, I'm seeing a majority of people saying no, that they don't have a formal strategy. All right. So now you should see the results launch on your screen. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's pretty overwhelming. <laughs> okay, well, that's why you're here, right? So let's let's talk about what that takes. Let's go to the next slide. I think 79% says everything we need to hear. Uh, that's uh, what we used to call a you know a wake up call. And you've you've heard the call. So let's get into this. So there's a common misperception that uh, people of color are just coming into philanthropy. Uh, they're just coming, st starting to, to learn about giving, and this is a misconception. Um, there are old organizations that have been fundraising for 75, 100 years more than that all across the country. A lot of African-American churches, uh, uh, historically black universities, uh, self-help organizations, Latino self-help organizations in California and Texas. Um, the American GI Forum is a, a organization that started a civil rights organization post-World War II by Latinos. United Negro College Fund is well known and so is MALDEF. All old organizations, all fundraised specifically from those populations of color. So um, we can move to the next slide. The main idea is that please challenge this misconception. Um, so let's talk about, and I'm gonna be very blunt, um, that's my style. Why haven't we raised money from people of color? The number one reason in my mind is because we haven't really tried to. Uh, intentionality will come up again and again in this presentation, and that's for a reason, because it's the number one way to raise money from people of color, is to ask them. They are not asked overwhelmingly. Um, we tend to fundraise in the circle of people we know, in the world of people we know. And when you see the staff board, information is overwhelmingly white in this country inside nonprofits. And so we're not going into other communities, other circles of influence. Um, and we're staying within the white population we know. Um, also too, there's a lack of knowledge about changes in wealth. A lot of people don't know about the new uh, Mexican American, Latino middle class in this country and upper middle class, and even uh, significant high net worth individuals. Um, also about the same thing with the African-American community in different parts of this country. Um, there's implicit bias. So implicit bias, as you know, is uh, basically looking for people who look like you in donors and staff and board and not really uh, branching out into other types of people. So going for people who look like you, people you understand from your community is what happens. And that's why a lot of um, hiring, board recruitment, and donors are the same color as the people who are asking. Um, also, too, there is a sense of victimization that Latinos and African Americans are victims and they're recipients of aid. They are not donors. <clears throat> There's nothing more empowering than being a donor and being a board member. And it, from my personal opinion, being a staff person, if you're working on issues that are vital to your community, what better than get, chipping in, giving, being active, and giving a lot too. So we can challenge victimization and the view of people of color as victims by empowering them with philanthropy. Um, and also, uh, finally, in the high net worth major gifts arena, it, you, you would be hard pressed to find anybody in our professional community talking about African-American and Latino uh, high net worth individuals and major giving. Un unfortunately, to my knowledge, I'm the only person talking about Latino major giving in the US today, which is weird and unfortunate, um, but uh, we wanna change that and we wanna bring in a lot more donors. But intentionality 
is the first point you need to know is that we need to intentionally pursue these people, intentionally research them, and intentionally engage them. We can change the game that way. So let's go to the next slide. And here we're going to talk um, a little more about the demographics behind this. So there's a great organization called the National Diversity Council, and the statistics they pull off are, are staggering. The growth in the population there, um, with Latinos, especially in the US, is really quite stunning, um, up to 128 million people by 2040. Um, and the, the stat here, when I show this slide to people that mo makes most people stop and look, is the Latino businesses in the US at $350 billion um, is staggering. A lot of small and medium businesses, a lot of future wealth uh, there for people. And also to uh, the growth in the African-American population and the buying power as you just showed up. People don't think of Latinos as having buying power. I urge you to look at TV commercials these days. I just saw a Frito-Lay commercial I saw a Honda commercial. And if you look at the people in the commercial, they could easily be Latinos. And they're doing that for a reason. Philanthropy in the nonprofit world has not caught up to the for-profit world that sees this information and says, you know who's got money to spend? You know, Latinos and Asians and African Americans. And so that's why it's important for us to really know the data and know that we're talking about growing into new markets. Let's go to the next slide, because I think uh, we've we these these uh, data points are pretty obvious. So um, this is a sort of a snarky question, maybe. Uh, who cares about diversity? The problem again and again is that we're asking the non-diverse to care about diversity, uh, and so it's a like being inside of a problem and not knowing it's a problem. What's shocking about uh, diversity in a nonprofit world is you can go back to the 80s, the 90s, and see articles by major foundation heads, major people lamenting the lack of diversity. And the stats really haven't changed. Um, there's even some stats I've saw recently, which I don't have here because I don't really have corroboration, that says the staffing has gotten worse. Um, in terms of a lack of diversity. So here's the shocking problem. I live in California. Um, it's even worse in California. 93% of boards are white people in California, where 47% of the population is Latino. So that's a cold bucket of water we all have to take a hard look at. This is the problem we're talking about, because we're only fundraising, involving, engaging, a partial amount of our community. We're not talking to the whole community. We're not fundraising, empowering, and working with the whole community. Um, and we're leaving a lot of money on the table if we just want to talk about fundraising alone. So let's move to the next slide. And uh, there's a big iceberg here because uh, there's a lot more below than what you see uh, in terms of fundraising, for my mind. So the hidden barriers. So the hidden barriers are the ones nobody wants to talk about. Um, and we have to really bring them out in the light of day. You know, it's like the elephant in the living room. Um, so racism, there is, and I have encountered it in the nonprofit world, straight up racism, <laughs> where people have misconceptions about other people, unfortunately, especially when it comes to donors and board. And there's tons in my mind of implicit bias. I've been on lots of boards. I've worked with lots of boards that recruit people they know of the same color because that's what they're comfortable with. Recruiting people from another unusual, different community is scary to them. Um, and finally, there is um, still, unfortunately, lots of sexism and lots of misconceptions about uh, the wealth and philanthropy of women out there. Um, and so we're going to answer this with some tools. So the first tool again is intentionality, is saying to ourselves, looking in the mirror and saying, you know, if you're an all white, to intentionally say, we have to communicate, we have to be safe, we have to be frank, and we have to be open. We need to look like our community. If, we, if you're in the city of Baltimore or the city of Los Angeles, 
does your board look like your community? Are you serving your whole community? Because you can have a lot of issues with program, with fundraising, because your board is looking at one small minority of the community, the white population. They're not looking at the whole community. So the board needs to have a frank, open conversation, not about, oh, we're not diverse, but what are we going to specifically do about it? Um, and do the hard work to research uh, and be intentional about recruiting, retaining people. So it all starts with the board um, and our board of directors. Uh, too often we want diversity because we put moral pressure and guilt on them. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked for 20 years, for God's sakes. We also don't want to promote tokenism, where we get any person of color on our board. Uh, our people on our board should just be just like the white people on our board. Uh, people of wealth, people of influence, leaders in the community. And also, too, this is something you need 100% board support on. This is something where you absolutely have to have the board behind you in unanimity, in 100%. So. There's a couple of ways to approach this with the board. Um, first of all, you have to set, in, in my consulting practice, the first thing I do is I set realistic timelines. If people want me to recruit board members, recruit staff, and help them with donor population, it's usually in that order. I'm gonna talk to them first about your board, um, then your staff, and then your donors. But all of that has to be set off with a timeline. And you can sell diversity to a board without moral pressure and guilt. There's a couple of ways that comes off the top of my head. If, you're, if they're in the corporate or business world, they'll understand new markets. Just like Coca-Cola and Honda are advertising to new markets, so we should be fundraising from, quote, new markets. That's a new markets model. You know, the African-American population has been in Atlanta forever. They're not a new market. But if you're not fundraising from them, you're missing the boat. Uh, Long-term sustainability and demographics. You know, things are changing in this country. You saw the population changes in, in the previous slide. If you wanna be around 20 years from now, you better get your fundraising changed right now. It takes time to change. Um, and finally, if you're not fundraising or engaging various communities, let's say you're a, a disease prevention organization in a city, how are you effective? If your fundraising is all white, but your outreach isn't diverse, you really can't empower a population. Fundraising is empowerment. And when you fundraise from a community that you're trying to serve as well, you can really empower them effectively. So that's a unique uh, way to look at it. Is don't just ask them to take a test, be a volunteer, ask them to give because you're helping them and their families. So yes, it is the hardest part of ensuring the diverse board is to get people to look at their lack of diversity and resolve to change it and to make a difference. Um, and so what we wanna look at, and here's my suggestion, and it's, it's a controversial one, is to look at your board recruitment. Um, the number one problem is boards recruit their own board members. So we have that loop they go on where they recruit white boards, recruit white board members. Um, they feel good if they recruit a woman sometimes, unfortunately. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, if you want diversity and your board recruitment is with your board, how is that working? Um, is the CDO, is the uh, ED or CEO involved in board recruitment is another question. My recommendation is to have development run board recruitment. In other words, to for development to use prospect research. And this is the thing, if you get one thing out of this whole presentation, it is the power of prospect research uh, to identify wealthy people of all colors and genders and sexual orientations to be part of your organization in giving and board membership and even sometimes in staff recruitment. Um, but that's the key role your board, you can play as a development officers when I consult with a client and they want a more diverse board, I will do my research and I will bring them forward candidates who are wealthy, connected, powerful of all colors. And it's possible in almost every town in this country. So let's, let's uh, cl click on here. Click on, that's a good term, huh? So let's talk about building a diverse donor base. 
And you have to have a good sense, get the demographics of your community. And your community may be a neighborhood in Pittsburgh or it may be the whole country if you're like a national institution. Understand who cares about your cause. Um, I was talking with a diabetes organization the other day um, that works across the West Coast. And they were highly focused on high net worth individuals and they have completely excluded the Latino population in their uh, prospect research and their definition of a major donor. So diabetes, Latinos, Mexican-Americans specifically suffer from it horrifically. So if anybody has a burning desire to stop diabetes, it's our population. So know who cares, who's affected by this. And most diseases, <clears throat> climate change, ineffective schools affect broad communities, not just one demographic. Um, and also, how does your community know about your cause or institution, or do they? Um, do they even know you're there? And watch out for those internal assumptions made by populations. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard uh, people in the Bay Area say, oh, Asian folks don't care about schools. They don't care about giving. They're not philanthropic. It's not in their culture. I've heard adults with college education say that. And I've heard people say, oh, you know, Latinos, they don't have a culture of philanthropy. That's, of course, nonsense. We sure do. You just don't know about it. Um, and so we got to watch out for those assumptions and challenge them. Um, so when we look at also building a, a diverse donor base, we want to ask, where are you? And um, talk about your physical external presence. If your website does not have a little button to go to Spanish or to another language, why not? Always put yourself in a perspective of being, imagine if you could get your entire community into one stadium, everybody in your whole community, and you had 15 minutes and a jumbotron to address them and to talk to them about your institution and get them to give, like a text to give campaign on the cell phone. Would you have the website, would you have the materials to reach your whole community? You probably wouldn't. Would your board look like the whole community? It probably doesn't. And so think about your whole community as you being in front of them. And does your board staff look like the community? Um, and do your issues matter to these people? Have they been educated? Have they been engaged? Have they been told, you know, you're part of this uh, the solution to whatever the problem is? Are you at their festivals? Are you at their churches? Are you present in their schools? Um, so are you physically present is a big issue. Um, I hear from a lot of uh, diverse leaders across the country is, you know, this organization, all they want is money from us. They're not in our community. Even if you are, people don't know, and you've got to make it clear. Um, so let's go to the next slide. But make sure and understand the intentionality of getting out there and showing your flag. So when it comes to staff recruitment, um, there are great executive search firms that you can ask and say, what's your rate of recruiting diverse staff? And they'll tell you, some will not know, and some, I imagine, don't have a great track record there. Um, but again, it's you need to uh, specifically look for diverse candidates. Doesn't mean the person's going to get the job, but if you have diversity in your candidate pool, it's more likely. Um, if you do in-house recruitment, again, you want to look for uh, specific areas where people um, can go after a good candidate who's at another organization, for example, and recruit them or steal them, if you want to say. There is also people of color affinity groups for almost everything. Uh, there's a lot you don't know about because you're not part of that community. And you have to get somebody from that community to talk to you about them. There's Facebook groups. There's all kinds of chat groups, professional groups. There's um, in AFP, there's you know people of color caucuses and organizations. And also too, you can, uh, I have an anecdotal information, no data to support it, but I've seen a trend of a lot of uh, young Latinas to be in development, but always be junior staff and never for whatever reason, move up in uh, the structure to become a director of development or higher. Um, so, what I've seen visited across the country, hundreds of nonprofits, there's always been the lower rung of development people being Latinas and not a lot of people moving up beyond that. 
So you need to look inside your own ranks as well for talent. And finally, there's Hispanic serving and historic black um, serving nations. You can recruit directly from them as well. So uh, let's do look at the next slide. Um, so that is a, a crucial way to be intentional and to focus on uh, going after specific people that look like your community so you can speak to your community. So when you look at donor diversity plans, there's a couple of key factors and tactics here. First of all, like I said, understand your demographics completely. Not just the numbers of by race, but the numbers by wealth. Um, you can do surveys as well. I've seen that done once with great success in New York. Um, nonprofit, um, I think I could talk about a little bit. They uh, surveyed the Puerto Rican and Dominican communities about the services, about the people's knowledge of this institution. And they got so much good information back. Um, specifically about how do they wanted to be approached, what they would give to, and they made a lot of... Um, are there community leaders you could identify and go to them hat in hand and say, we really want to engage your community. How do we do that? Um, how would you recommend? And they'll give you guidance. And some of the guidance they're going to give you is to look for business associations, churches, and civic organizations. Go speak at their organizations. Um, if you recruit staff that are multilingual or multicultural, that's going to help you a lot. One thing I've done um, is I've done a sub campaign. Um, so when I worked for a health organization, we did a very specific targeted campaign in the Asian community. And we had we we used it as a tool not only to do good program work, but also to to approach Asian major donors to say, would you guys consider giving fifty thousand dollars each to help us, you know, launch this prevention work inside your community? And it was very successful, but it was a way to boost uh, high net worth givers and major givers by addressing something specifically in their community. It's what's called, I think, it's a very compelling ask. So let's go to the next slide. So do think about a sub campaign. Now, again, when you're talking about major gifts, you've got to have prospect research behind you. If you do not have prospect research in a staff person, you need to hire a freelance prospect researcher. And I'll tell you about where to get that in a few minutes. Um, I look for affinity circles. I look for communities inside companies, inside professions inside neighborhoods, inside society circles. Sometimes what's unique about, um, I don't know about African-Americans more, but more Latinos is you need to create new philanthropy. Um, so some of the Latino major donors, I've gotten six and seven figure gifts from personally. Um, my consulting is based on a personal experience. It's not based on theory. Uh, I'm not an academic. I've done, I've actually done this in the field and raised these gifts is that new philanthropy, sometimes you have very high wealth, but no one's ever engaged them in a philanthropic discussion before. So that's another unique twist about fundraising, especially for wealthy Latinos. Um, and there's a lot of wealth that's privately held. I've seen this in Florida and Texas too, um, in real estate and private business, that's harder to see. Um, so you have to do, again, research on this. And there's very cool businesses, associations, chambers of commerce, uh, legal aid organizations where you can find wealthy Hispanics, wealthy African Americans, wealthy Asians clustered together right there for you to look at. And finally, know the dominant industries for um, people of color's wealth in your area. You know, if you go to LA, you'll see construction and law as being really strong industries for Latinos to make a lot of money. Um, sometimes two parking lots is another one I've seen. Um, so let's talk about ID techniques. Now, if you don't have a freelance prospect researcher, at the end of this presentation is my website. There's a free page. I don't make any money off of it. It's just a free listing of prospect researchers. And they're like consultants. But the main idea is they will tell you, you will ask them, okay, I'm in Denver. I need to find the diverse board members. So who care about, I don't know, animal welfare. Let's pick that subject. So I need animal welfare potential donors who can give over $5,000 a year, who are African-American, Asian, or Latino, uh, hopefully uh, with a good mix of women in there. Um, I need a list of 35 people. So that's what you'll do. And you'll hire these people to bring that to you. 
you know, hopefully with contact information, and there you have your recruitment list. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so your research will tell you who's wealthy, how they got to their wealth, and it's important to look at how they got to their wealth because then you can model uh, that person and find other people like that. So in the tech industry in the Bay Area, I have found Latinos who went to a good university, got a job at a major company, Apple, Google, Intel, and rose up the ranks. That's a modeled person for me. I've got like a half a dozen people like that, who through, because their institution was not colored, there were no color barriers, they were able to move up and make a great deal of money uh, and have high six-figure salaries. Um, and so that's a model. Once you find one, you can find others. I use LinkedIn a lot, and LinkedIn can often show you circles of influence, um, groups people belong to, and there's lots of uh, uh, diverse people of color organizations on LinkedIn, um, like a Latino major business organization. I found many. And prospect research can help you identify wealth and key industries in your community and find the highest person of color in that, in that industry. Um, and finally, like I said, you can find associations, um, all kinds of associations. Um, you know, the classic one I found is uh, legal organization, you know, Washington DC Latino Lawyers Association. And then you can li literally search by people who are partners in major firms. And it's, it, you know, that's not that hard to figure out. They're probably making a pretty good mid to high range six figure salary depending on the type of law they practice as well. But that's, look for industries where your family background, pedigree, you know, are less important and merit and hard work are more important. Um, so uh, if you look at Los Angeles, for example, there's a lot of small companies um, being built by Latinos because it's, it's up to them and up to their own ability to, to get ahead. Um, so let's take a look at some case studies. I think I'm moving pretty quickly here. I should slow down a bit. Uh, if we have any questions, uh, you can ask the question and um, I'll answer it. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit, uh, Pearl or Krista? Or do we ho hold the questions to the end? Hi, yes, we do actually have one question. I'm gonna let Krista uh, take it away. Yeah, and you might have already covered it in the last uh, slide when you were talking about um, identifying different uh, donors. But specifically, once you've identified them, like at the Hispanic uh, Latino Lawyers Association, what's the best approach? Maybe the next well, step. You know, I'm not shy. The best approach is call them and go see them. Um, and it, that is a, a cold call. Um, but you do want to see, um, it depending on what it is, uh, affinity for what you do. Um, so if you're an environmental organization, if you see uh, anything that indicates their a good prospect researcher will tell you if they give to environmental organizations, but uh, there might be something that'll tell you that they would have affinity for what you do. Um, so I do look for not just race and wealth, but I look for affinity uh, as well. Um, when I worked for um, a major uh, Latino arts organization, I did have the luxury of approaching Latinos in general uh, even if they weren't involved in the arts because they were Latinos. And I hope there was some pride involved. In some instances there were, in some instances there weren't. But it is um, a guessing game. You are approaching people and qualifying them um, and seeing if they're interested. So th that's what I would do is go and see people and engage them individually. Wonderful, thank you. And I have another uh, question for you as well. You talked a little bit, Armando, about potentially uh, translating your website or certain materials for donors into different languages. And there's a question that um, they're having a little bit of a challenge finding an affordable Spanish translator opportunity. So what are some of your recommendations on how to take those steps to actually translate materials? Um, I, I don't, um, so there's, there's technical thing I should tell you so I, I don't, I'm not a technical person about websites. I do know that they are expensive. Um, the one caveat I would make sure you do is that if you translate it, um, Spanish speaking people speak 
there's many types of Spanish. If you hear a Puerto Rican and a Mexican, it's almost a different language. And so whatever your demographic of your community is, you want to be sensitive to the words, uh, vocabulary, phrases uh, that are colloquial to the type of Latinos you have in your community. Um, but in terms of actual programs and, and site uses, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not a technical person. I've seen good ones and I've seen bad ones. And I can talk to that person afterwards about some good translations. I've seen on websites. They may be expensive. I don't know. Wonderful. Thank you. And we will have more time for questions um, after your presentation as well. Very cool. So people load them up. Um, this is a lot of fun. So the, there was a lot of buzz when the first uh, talk of the National Museum of African American History and Culture came up. And people were wringing their hands saying, how are they going to raise that much money? And they did it uh, beautifully. 143 founding donors of a million plus. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Three donors of 20 million plus. And so the whole idea that African-Americans can't do a major campaign like this was just physically decimated. Um, one organization I've seen do incredible work around Latinos is the Latino Community Foundation. Um, their development team is first class. And they've created um, $1,000 giving circles of people who give $1,000 and they work and cluster together to decide who they're going to give the money to in the Latino nonprofit population. Um, and so this is, I believe, in one year, 795,000. I'm not sure. But it's a really good example of uh, approaching middle class uh, Latinos and asking them for $1,000 a year. It's a really strong population. So your mid range donors right now, there are a lot more Latino prospects out there than you probably know about. Um, in the arts, uh, there's the Perez Museum in Miami, which was started with a big uh, founding $30 million gift from, I think his name is Jorge. That's right, Jorge Perez. And they've almost completed the $220 million campaign. This is mostly from Latinos in Florida of all stripes. And a few um, outside folks too, Venezuelanos too. Uh, for those are people from Venezuela, sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, a diverse population but powerful dollars that were involved here. Um, so when people th think there's no high net worth giving, it depends who you're talking about and it depends if you're approached. Another campaign that was strongly African-American and led by an African-American is the Apollo Theater campaign in New York. And that was a $20 million campaign. I believe they're done with that campaign, if not close to being done with that campaign. Uh, but that's uh, a great example. Now we're gonna talk about um, a really stunning work St. Jude has done. Uh, and uh, they've worked with Univision. You can go to the next slide, there's more there. In the last, since I think it's since 97, they've raised about $110 million from Spanish speaking donors. Now, um, as a Mexican American like me, I do listen to Spanish language radio. I do cook Mexican food every night. <laughs> So I go to the Mexican market in town here, and St. Jude's everywhere, okay? St. Jude is on Univision, which is our major channel. If you check out at the market at Mi Pueblo and you're buying food, it says in Spanish, do you want to give to St. Jude? Um, if you're at a, a concert, uh, a sports team, it'll say in Spanish to you, do you want to give to St. Jude? You'll get, I get mailers in English and Spanish from St. Jude. So somebody over there has figured it out. And uh, the whole use of celebrity uh, is something that uh, Latinos, for whatever reason, good or bad, maybe I'll make somebody angry with this, we're particularly vulnerable to. We love our singers, our media personalities. Um, their endorsement means something to us. And we're, Latinos are specifically uh, generous toward children's and children's health organizations. Um, there's a very high percentage of giving. Um, one from my personal experience from Latinas for women's health organizations, they give far beyond their means and more than uh, Caucasian women of uh, the same area and same demographics. So that's an interesting stat. You should absolutely look at uh, St. Jude as an interesting model 
Also, too, there's, um, let's see, the Children's uh, Hospital Organization. I got, just popped out of my brain what it was called. That's done a lot of organizations um, around uh, children's hospitals across the country with Latinos and approaching them through media, through concerts. So Steady St. Jude and their work, they're a great example of raising tens of millions of dollars um, in small giving from Latinos all over the country. So uh, if we take a look at the next slide, I think that's uh, pretty close to it. Let's take a look here. Yeah, so let's take some questions. Yeah, we have some great questions. I'm gonna kick it over to Krista to get started. Great, Armando, thank you so much for those great case studies. Here's a question. In many uh, cases that this individual has experienced, EDs tend to prioritize diversity um, and leaders of the organization, diversity in all other aspects of the organization, except the development department. So yep. how would you respond to EDs or CEOs, even those of color, um, that believe their mostly white donor base currently should be stewarded by white development staff? Well, look at the demographics of your community. I mean, there are some places in the country, you know, Oklahoma, Vermont, that aren't very diverse, but the most of the country is diverse now and becoming diverse. You know, even those places I mentioned are probably becoming more diverse every day. So I would approach them and say, if this is just no altruism, no morality, this is shared money. If we want to raise money in our state, in our community, we need to get to everybody. And we need to approach everybody, not just a minority white population. And so do your study, do your demographics. And if you have another nonprofit in your community successfully doing this, you can do a keeping up with the Joneses and, you know, say this XYZ organization, you know, they got a $5 million gift from an African American woman. You know, we're not doing anything like that. Um, and so that's one way you can uh, uh, study them. I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards about how to do that and more specifics. But like I said, do your research, know your community, look for wealth in your community that's diverse and target your efforts to the whole community fundraising. It's just common sense. Great, thank you. Here's another question and a different perspective. My organization is mostly people of color, luckily including the CEO. However, I'm a white woman hired to be the fundraising coordinator. What should my approach be in recruiting people of color and donors? And how much can this person be the face of the organization and how much should they allow the director and others to communicate the mission and, and the work? It's, it's, I mean, it's great to have a person of color representing an institution, but you know, diverse means white people too. And so it's not a, a exclusionary thing. If you're good on the mission, you know what's going on, then include people of color when you think you need to for some people. Um, but do your job, do your research. It all, it's all based in my mind on great prospect research. Um, if you're doing a good job, it shouldn't matter uh, your color. Um, and do your research and identify the right allies um, and right donors, uh, you know, for your population, for your organization. Right. And I was going to add, too, that sometimes when we go in to either steward or, or make an ask with a new uh, donor, it, it's a team approach as well. So it's yeah. sometimes the, the development director or the um, fundraising coordinator is bringing the right team together and knowing based on that donor and the research that they've done who the right person is as well. So it doesn't always have to be one person. It could be a team, um, which is another important way to Obviously, show yeah. diversity on the team. Great. Wonderful. And, uh, you here's know, another cool question. You represent the whole community. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Were you going to say something, Armando? Go for it. <laughs> no, no. Is there another question? Yeah, so how do you recruit people to start donor circles? Oh boy, you recruit, you create the model of the donor circle, uh, what the amount is. Um, you explain to them how the process works to uh, decide democratically who, who they're gonna give to each year. You do have to study the demographics, financial demographics of your community to understand what they could support. So uh, LCF came up with a $1,000 benchmark gift. They also, in their information, make it really clear that you don't have to 
just write a thousand dollar check, you can pledge it or have an automatic deduction. So it brings it, uh, it makes it more accessible for people. So, and then you look for circles of influence. So if you have Latina lawyers, for example, who's the most prominent Latina lawyer who's maybe, you know, part of a major firm, a major partner, well-known, maybe beloved, well-liked, you approach the highest person on the mountain you can and recruit them to be your chair of your giving circle. And then um, inside that demographic, inside that affinity circle of other Latina lawyers, let's say you're in Houston, you look at who else is making money and doing well in law and is a Latina, and that person works with you to approach each of those people or maybe have an event where you approach them and you talk about what your money is gonna go to and how you're gonna decide it and start recruiting people. Create a committee to do so and uh, a committee, a major gifts committee or giving circle committee is another way to go too. Great, and maybe it's a future topic for webinars next year is diving deeper into what donor circles are and, and also we can talk more in the future about how, how to start one and some of the really exciting ones um, that we see in our communities as well. So that's, I like that topic and I, and I like the answer to that. Thank you. Yeah, Let, great. How about one more? Um, okay. Do you have any advice specifically on how to push, you know, what we're talking about with an organization? I think we've talked a little bit about it, but with an organization whose leadership is majority white, how do we essentially sell the need for doing this work intentionally and formally. And I think you've talked about it a little bit today, but um, sure. what's a good next step for someone to go back after this webinar to their office? So uh, I was uh, talking to an environmental organization, a big one the other day about this exact subject. And so talking to their board, you know, I told them that toxic waste uh, surprisingly is uh, a bigger issue for people of color than uh, white people. And that because of a lot of the way, the places they put toxic dumps and companies feel more comfortable doing bad things when there's people with less lawyers, for example. Um, and so your community is about, you know, the whole community. It's not just about the people you know. And you want to empower those people, not just with uh, action, but with fundraising. Fundraising is empowerment. And so it's important for us, for our mission, it's important for our future sustainability, and it's important uh, for empowerment of people to change their, in this instance, change their communities and fight back by giving um, and, and making a difference. But you can use the new markets approach, but I like the empowerment approach. And this is what I said to them, is that your movement, environmental movement is overwhelmingly white, but the problem isn't. You know, uh, climate change, toxic waste, bad air, it doesn't just stop at white people's houses, you know, it goes everywhere. And so everybody cares about this. There's actually a very good study that shows the number one issues, the number one giving issue for Latinos is in the environment. Second is children. Um, and so why aren't Latinos giving to the environment? Because nobody's asking them, that's why. Mm. Thank you. We have so many questions coming in, but we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so if you do have questions, if they weren't answered, please keep the conversation going on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. You can tag um, the found, I'm sorry, tag Sanford Institute of Philanthropy. You can tag Armando as well. And here is his contact information. So do uh, check out my, web, my website. I do have a, a page on the diversity practice, but also feel free to email me with your question. Yeah, or yeah. on, on uh, is that your Twitter ha handle? Yeah, they could also tweet with the SIP hashtag and ask you questions on Twitter. And don't forget to also tag the Sanford Institute so that we can also answer your questions or forward them on. Um, and there are so many great questions here that it's obvious that we probably need to have um, more uh, conversations like this in the future, Armando. So thank you so much. And definitely, um, if you want to take a picture of this slide, just as a reminder, you're going to receive this slide in an email in the coming days. So you'll have all this information at your fingertips. You can watch this again on your own time. But if you want to contact Armando before then, definitely take a picture of this slide so you can do that.
Thank you Perfect. so much, Armando. We were so happy to have you. We were so excited about this webinar. It's just such a critical conversation that we're really happy to be a part of and to help elevate. Um, for all those who listened, thank you as well for tuning in. Don't miss our next webinar next month on top technology trends, how to prepare your nonprofit and your community. And this is going to be an exclusive live only webinar. So definitely register and tune in. It's um, 11 o'clock Pacific time on October 17th. Also, please take our survey. We really take these survey responses seriously and every month look to improve our webinars. So we really appreciate in advance you taking the survey and leaving your feedback. Thank you everyone so much. We were so happy to have you and we really look forward to having you in future webinars um, and next month. Have a great day. Thank you very much.